In the last episode of the Efficient Hunter and Steward of Nature podcast, we talked about hunting in the widest context, about the steward of nature and how hunting is a force of good in nature when done right. In this episode, we're going to zoom right in on an element, a critical element of efficient hunting. We're going to zoom in on shooting. And I'm going to start to answer the question, how do you make sure you never miss a shot in the field, but still make the most of your opportunities when hunting? My answer is going to revolve around the hunter's field marksmanship test. And there's lots of concepts we're going to unpack, including accuracy versus precision, the effect of time pressure, the effect of different shooting positions, and not the least, the distinction between point of aim, point of impact, and group size. Welcome to the Efficient Hunter and Shooter Nature podcast. Here you get tools to help you master rifle hunting and inspiration to help you make hunting a force of good in nature. What I'm sharing is based on 30 years of hunting on three continents and I've condensed my lessons learned based on the same tools I use to optimize processes for large multinational corporations. I've packed everything up as checklists and procedures that you can use to set yourself up for success when hunting. So in this episode, we're going to answer the question, how do you never miss a shot when hunting, but still make the most of your opportunities? Why is that an important question? Well, there's several reasons why you don't want to miss a shot. And I'll get to them in a moment. For now, I want to stress that it's a relevant or important question because it's easy to miss a shot. If you're not 100% certain or clear on your capabilities, in a given hunting situation. Sure, there are situations where missing a shot is difficult. If you're in a solid high seat tree stand with a good, solid, stable rest, you can survey lots of ground, so you have adequate time from when you spot the animal till you need to take a shot. And the distance might be, let's say, 100, 150 meters or 150 yards which means that you're far enough from the animal that you can afford to make a few mistakes in terms of making adjustments and moving around a bit. In those cases, shots are straightforward. But if you are a little more adventurous, if you're shooting at longer ranges, if you're shooting under conditions where you use a type of field rest that might be less stable than when you're shooting off the bench, or if you're shooting under time pressure, in those cases, we usually shoot below our best. Our group size open up. A point of impact might shift, which we're going to look at in a moment. In those cases, you're not necessarily drilling the same small group size that you are from the bench. And in those cases, it's critical to understand your actual capabilities. And if you don't understand those capabilities, well then it is easy to miss a shot. Turns out there's a way to help you be 100% confident about your capabilities in a given situation. I'm gonna share that in a moment. And I'm gonna share two anecdotes that illustrate some of the situations that this tool is relevant for. Some of the mistakes that are easily made. And we're gonna talk about how you can avoid them. I'm also gonna share some of the details on how I discovered my own limits or capabilities when shooting the test bipod prone. And as I said, we're gonna examine the distinction between point of aim, point of impact, and group size. I keep talking about those three concepts because I see lots of hunters uh, mixing them up. And as I said earlier, that can have a significant, uh, severe consequences when you're actually out hunting. There's a lot to hunting, but in my world, taking a shot is the moment of truth. And when I take a shot, I, I don't want to cause unnecessary suffering for the animal. I want a clean kill. 
I also want to live up to my role as a steward of nature by doing uh, my part. I'd rather not come across as less competent if I'm hunting with a friend or if I'm hunting with a guide. And I definitely want to make the most of my hunting time and budget. That applies if I'm hunting on my own home turf or if I'm abroad and have paid good money for a trip. If one or more of those reasons apply to you, then the Hunter's Field Marksmanship Test is definitely going to be a valuable tool in your toolbox. One that will help you avoid missing a shot and still make the most of the opportunities you get when hunting. I've got two anecdotes that illustrate two extremes of missing a shot, making the most of your opportunities. The first story is from a time when I was guiding a client to shoot munchak bucks in the south of England. The first mistake was uh, on my part. I assumed that the client was happy to shoot off my sticks. I didn't consider letting him try them or sear off them or test them, whatever. We headed into the woods as the sun was rising, giving us just enough light to see among the trees and, and the shrubs in the woods. We hadn't stalked for that long before I uh, spotted a, a munchak buck. First I saw the shadow scuttling around in the, on the forest floor and it was pretty clear that that was a big animal which took my excitement a notch up. And when I got the uh, binoculars on him, I could see that there was a big trophy as well. So excited, I put the sticks up and urged my client, signaled my client to get on the sticks and shoot before our little friend left the area. To my big surprise, the client refused to shoot, even though the distance wasn't great. I don't know, it might have been Let's call it 75 meters, 75 yards ish. Not long distance. Completely feasible, even though a munchak is not a, a huge animal, it's rather small, but it wasn't far for that shot. But the guy was just not comfortable shooting off sticks. And though I applaud uh, when hunters make a pass on a shot because they're concerned they're not going to hit, I think in this case, he severely underestimated his own capabilities which resulted in missing an opportunity to shoot a great trophy. On the other end of the spectrum my other story is about a time early in my career as a hunter. I might have had my license for a year, two or three. I was stalking through woods to shoot roebuck in the summer and I was approaching a uh, in the woods. I was inside the woods and I was approaching a, a, a corner of a field and as I started surveying that corner from within the woods I spotted a roebuck eating the crops. For whatever reason I hadn't brought my shooting sticks so I decided to use one of the big beech trees as a rest or at least to give me some more stability. That shooting position just didn't agree with me. I should probably have shot offhand uh, it was almost like I was getting more unstable trying to force this uh, this tree into becoming a, some sort of rest. Regardless, I should have called it quits when it was clear to me that I just wasn't properly on target. For whatever reason, I decided to pull the trigger and unfortunately I missed the roebuck and I could see him running across that field into the woods on the other side, leaving me with this horrible feeling. So where my client underestimated his capabilities, in that situation I overestimated my own capabilities. No excuses, but that's easily done if you're a little bit under pressure, if you're not clear on your capabilities. The good thing is, it doesn't have to happen to you. Okay, so not missing a shot, but still shooting when you have a real opportunity is all about understanding your capabilities in a given shooting situation. So when we talk about capabilities, we can 
break the successful shot down into different factors to understand what influences uh, success and what influences your capabilities in a given situation. So let's break that shot down. So the first point on the list uh, in the broader sense in my book is shot's got to be safe. That's non-negotiable. The second factor is that you've got to have a clear shot. I guess you can say that it's some way related to uh, making an accurate shot, but I treat a clear shot as a separate check because it is an individual check that you should always perform before pulling the trigger. The third step is that you've got to take a shot that's sufficiently precise. And precise or precision is about the size of your group. So precision uh, is influenced by rifle capability, how inherently accurate is your rifle? Uh, ammunition capability, how consistent uh, is your ammunition and how well suited is it for your particular rifle? The precision is also influenced by the shooting precision. Any given shooting precision will have a, an element of inherent precision. So for instance, shooting off a bench is more precise, generally speaking, than shooting off a pair of sticks because of the stability in, in each of those types of rests. And finally, precision is also influenced by, by you and the shooter capability. You may be better or not so good to execute a shot from a, a given position. Then a successful shot is influenced by the accuracy. And accuracy is how close your point of impact is to your point of aim the shots hit where you aim. Accuracy is influenced by rifle zero. For longer range shots, it's also influenced by uh, your ability to assess the wind, strength, direction. For longer range shots, accuracy is also influenced by your ability to predict the uh, trajectory, the bullet drop, which part of that is influenced by your ability to judge the distance, atmospheric conditions, etc. And accuracy can also be influenced by the shooting position, again, where for accuracy, shooting position as a factor is on the list because you can, you can experience a point of impact change between two different uh, shooting positions. So if you shoot prone uh, from your bipod, or if you shoot uh, sitting with a sling, you might have a, a slight point of impact change. At super short ranges, they might not be noticeable, uh, but at longer range they will be more pronounced. And finally, accuracy will also be influenced by shooter capability, as you'll see later from my test. Why? Because under uh, time pressure, you might not execute your position as well, and you might jerk the trigger, shifting your point of impact, which is part of, of the accuracy element. A successful shot also needs to be lethal, and what I mean by that is it's got to tick the right boxes for terminal uh, ballistics. Is your bullet matched to the terminal velocity and the animal you're shooting? And finally, a successful shot is on time before the animal leaves because it's got better things to do or before the animal leaves because it's spotted you. So in terms of answering the question, how do you never miss a shot when hunting but still make the most of your opportunities, I want to focus on situations where uh, you're shooting within your maximum point-blank range. So situations where you don't have to make a wind call adjustments, where you don't need to make uh, or any adjustments for bullet drop. We can also park safety and the clear shot element and uh, terminal ballistics, all those elements out of scope. So we're talking about maximum point-blank range shots or shot within your maximum point-blank range. We're going to focus on uh, three elements to understand your capabilities. I'm going to focus on uh, precision, accuracy, and the time as a factor. So let's just recap. How do you never miss? How do you make the most of your opportunities? Well, the short answer is you've got to know your capabilities. You've got to know when to shoot. You've got to know when to pass an opportunity. And to understand your capabilities, we're now going to look at how can you be 100% certain about your ability 
in terms of precision, accuracy and time. I use the Hunter's Field Marksmanship Test to assess these factors to give me certainty of my capabilities. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about how you actually do the test. Then we're going to talk about how you evaluate your results. Then we're going to talk about how those results will inform your training practice and then how the results will inform uh, what you do in the field, how you use the results when hunting in the field. And when it comes to hunting in the field, that's when I'm going to talk more about distinguishing between point of impact, point of aim and group size. Because I think, at least from what I see, there's a real pitfall hidden in those three factors if you don't apply them correctly, which means if you don't apply them honestly. So the field marksmanship test is a 10 shot test. It's specific to one single shooting position with a particular set of uh, sticks, or bipod, what have you. It is the exact gear that you want to use, you've got to test. So how do you perform the test? Well, there's first an element of preparation, and we're going to talk about how you shoot the test. And I have a, a few practical notes, and then I'm going to give you an example of me shooting the test recently. So in terms of preparation, the first step is to decide what shooting position, what gear you're using. The second step is to decide the time limit you're going to set yourself. The time limit is critical for a number of reasons. First and foremost, because it adds an element of pressure, the same type of pressure that you have in the field. Pressure because you don't know how much time you have, so you've got to hurry, but also but also a slight element of stress that's going to be more significant for some people and less significant for other people. But the point is that you need to determine a time that will challenge you. Another point is that you need to get a timer. Practically speaking, well, you need a countdown timer. And it's helpful if you can get a countdown timer that can uh, that gives you like a pre-countdown. So it counts down before the actual countdown starts. That allows you just to get in position. And finally, you need uh, an adequate target. I created a, a test target that shows you your uh, group size in minute angle. And I've created them as an, a metric version that indicates MOA at 100 meters. And I've created a, an imperial version that shows uh, the uh, MOA at 100 yards. I put a link to the episode page in the show notes where you can find those um, those targets. You can download them. Okay, so how do you shoot the test? You've established your shooting position. So you start from what I call cold ready, which I'll get back to. When the countdown starts, you get from your ready position, get into position and fire a shot. When you fire a shot, you get back to your quote unquote, cold ready, and you fire the remaining 10 rounds on the countdown. When I say cold ready, I mean a ready position, not as your usual ready position you see at the shooting range where people sit behind the rifle at a bench. I mean the position that you're gonna be starting from when hunting in the field. So if you're shooting off sticks, you usually have your rifle on your shoulder in a sling and your sticks in your hand. So that's a ready position. And then when the timer starts, you've got to get your sticks out ready, put your rifle in the sticks on target, and then take the shot. That makes the test more relevant, more realistic. It gives you an opportunity to practice not just your shooting techniques, but the entire chain of transitions required to get you on target. And it, um, it adds an element of pressure by having to get ready, go through the motions of getting set up rather than just pulling the trigger. Okay, so there's a couple of practical nodes. It's a 10 shot test, but I suggest that you let your barrel cool down sufficiently uh, between each shot. I also suggest that regardless of your practice when hunting, you start with your bolt closed on an empty chamber. 
that adds an element of safety. And if you want more detailed instructions, check out the show notes. I'm going to link to a page with more detail where you can also find those targets. So as I said, I recently shot the test. I shot the test for bipod prone. I uh, gave myself a 15 second time limit. My cold ready was with my rifle uh, in my right hand, bolt closed on an empty chamber, rifle horizontally pointing towards the target, and my Spartan Precision bipod in my other hand. As the countdown timer started, I uh, attach the bipod, get into a shooting position and take the shot. I fire the 10 shots, and then proceeded to evaluate the targets, which is what we're gonna talk about next. Before we do that, I just wanna ask you if you find this content helpful, if you think the idea of this Hunter's Field marksmanship test will help you better understand your capabilities and in turn, make sure you don't miss any shots, but still make the most of opportunities. If that's the case, I'd be grateful if you recommend the episode to another hunter. And that way, help me spread the word about efficient hunting. Okay, so how do you evaluate your test? Well, first of all, you look for changes in precision and then you look for changes in accuracy. Changes in precision is, as we talked earlier about, the group that opens up. Changes in accuracy is when your point of impact moves away from your point of aim. The point of impact is going to suggest what type of mistakes you might have made. I'm going to do a separate video on, on how to interpret your target. For now, let's just talk about what I saw when I shot my test. First of all, as, as I kind of expected, my group opened up from just a little over half an MOA with three, th three shots to reference um, target. So it might have been bigger if I'd shot five or even the 10 shots I shot for the test. Anyway, uh, it went from half an MOA to about just uh, over one MOA. Still uh, completely uh, adequate for hunting, but, but uh, an indication that what we see on the range or a reminder what we see on the range is not rarely what we get in the field. Time pressure, um, less than perfect conditions, all that stuff, you're tired, you're in a hurry, etc. In terms of accuracy, my point of impact moved to the right. I think it was about one MOA to the right. When that moves straight to the right, for a right-hand shooter or straight to the left for a left-hand shooter, it's usually an indication that you don't have natural point of aim or that the position of one of your elbows is, is a bit off. And when I looked at the video, because I videoed the test, I could see, well, first of all, I knew that my shooting mat was square on the target. And I could see when I set my rifle up in the test for each shot, that was usually always uh, square on the mat, so it would have been square on the target. But what I noticed was that although it felt like I was square on my rifle, I was actually starting to move a little bit uh, to the left of the rifle, which is something I'm still working on refining. I was definitely square on the rifle when I shot the reference uh, target to establish my, uh, my zero, but time pressure meant one, that I didn't have sufficient time to really check my natural point of aim. And, and I'll, I'll cover those checks in another episode. But it also meant there was so much going on or enough going on for me that I didn't, uh, I didn't feel my position well enough. Yeah, I, I couldn't feel that I was off. So as I said earlier, time pressure is usually a good way of discovering uh, some of the errors you might make. And I think for, for sure on the range, it's the right time to, to discover those errors. And again, as we talked about with precision, you might have a change or you're likely to have a change in accuracy, change in point of impact when you're shooting under time pressure because you don't have time to run all the checks. And unless you spend enough time to refine each of your shooting positions, you don't feel the position well enough. When I say feel, I mean, yeah, you, I, mean, what I, mean, I mean feel. You can't feel if the position is correct. 
together that that really emphasizes the benefits of the test in terms of you understanding your capability so in turn that you can make sure you don't miss a shot but also that you will take a shot when you are capable of it. Okay, let's just talk about how you use the results of the test to inform your uh, your practice or training. First of all, in general, you want to improve your precision, which means going through uh, all the steps to tidy up everything you do. I think the, the precision and time kind of go hand in hand in the sense that the more time you have, the more time you have to execute your position right. I guess time goes hand in hand with accuracy as well. What I'm getting onto is that although executing a shot is what this test is about, but the more you refine getting into position, the transitions from your cold ready to you're ready to shoot, the more time you buy yourself to just make the final adjustments for the position and the more time you buy yourself to pull the trigger correctly. All those little details that still have a big impact. And that's, that's why I think the test is so relevant for hunting because we're always under an element of time pressure, usually unknown. But the more you squared away, the smoother you are, the faster you get into position and the more time you buy yourself to execute the shot flawlessly. So that's, that's one aspect. And the other aspect is whatever the test revealed. In my case, my natural, I didn't have natural point of aim under time pressure. So I'm gonna now spend even more time working on natural point of aim or not just working on natural point of aim because I could get into natural point of aim when I shot the reference target. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna feel for natural point of aim in the sense that I wanna I want to be able to feel that my natural point of aim is correct without having to do much checking. In general, there are four different tools that you can use when uh, when planning your practice sessions. So there is uh, live fire, the, the obvious one. And again, stating the obvious, your live fire should be from the position that you're working on. And then there is dry fire, which in my view is totally overlooked. There's a lot of the things that you need to improve to become a better shot that you can do with dry fire. And you can do dry fire on the range. Let's say every third shot you dry fire and you can do dry fire at home. And I think when I say dry fire, I don't mean just pulling the trigger. I mean the entire sequence of transitions that get you from cold ready to actual pulling the trigger. I think you should consider for each shot that you fire on the range at least three or even five shots of dry fire at the range or at home. And then something people don't talk much about is even less about than they do about dry fire is visualization. Visualization needs to go hand in hand with actual uh, dry fire, live fire, but it can be a great way of making sure that uh, you practice s small techniques or sub techniques if you will like the trigger pull as long as you practice it correctly with dry fire live fire you can run through your trigger pull when you have a moment um, make sure you, you get some repetitions in that way and finally there's pressure testing which is a test like the hunter's field marksmanship test i think pressure testing is necessary to simulate field conditions and get a sense for your capability but it's also, it's also critical in terms of giving you a little bit of motivation. You're always going to perform worse under time pressure than you are without time pressure. The worst performance is going to give you more input to what you can improve. I recently listened to a podcast with Andrew Huberman, and he mentioned a ratio, a, a scientifically tested ratio, of good reps versus pressure reps. And he said the ratio was, I believe, 85% perfect reps and 15% pressure reps. That should be the, the, the right ratio to get you to do things right, but still 
keep you motivated and still reveal any flaws in your technique without hurting your true performance. Okay, how to use the test when hunting? You have two options. One option is to engineer situations where you have adequate time or accept that if you don't have adequate time, you won't take the shot. The second option is to adjust the maximum distance you shoot at based on your new uh, under pressure uh, precision and accuracy. This is where the distinction between point of aim, point of impact and group size becomes super relevant. And you gotta be careful about how you use the concepts. Let's use my results as an example. So my reference group size was about, let's call it half MOA. My um, test group size was one MOA. However, my point of impact shifted to the right. It shifted so much to the right that the distance from my point of aim to the furthest shot, or the shot furthest away from point of aim, was one fuller MOA. So if we talk about those results in, in relation to the target, you can actually argue that my group size was two MOA. So the point I wanna make is just don't, don't overestimate the results you get from the test. Be totally honest to yourself about the practical application of the test results on a vital zone. Because only that way you're gonna know your true capabilities for a given shooting position uh, in a given shooting or hunting situation. And that way, fully understanding your capabilities, you are gonna avoid missing shots, but still gonna be able to make the most of your opportunities. So let's put all this back into context. A client I was guiding underestimated, in my view, his own capabilities. If he'd shot this test of sticks, I'm sure he would have discovered that he could easily made the shot and gone home with a monster munchak buck. If I'd shot the test for leaning off a beech tree, I would have discovered that the distance I shot at was too far for my capabilities and I wouldn't have pulled the trigger and I wouldn't have been left with that horrible feeling of missing an animal. I hope that you'll use this test and I hope that it'll help you fully understand your capabilities with a given field rest. And I hope it'll help you never miss a shot when hunting. And I hope that it'll make sure that you never pass an opportunity where you could have shot an animal. A great hunter is not necessarily someone who shoots well. It is someone who knows their capabilities and shoots within those capabilities. And by the way, shooting the Hunter's Field Marksmanship Test is a ton of fun. Adding time pressure just makes a range session even more fun. And from a practical perspective, it's going to give you so much input, so much more input and food for thought on what to improve, what's not to like. Check out the show notes for a link to the episode page with a transcript with the targets and more details on how to shoot the test and if you found the concept of the hunter's field marksmanship test helpful then please recommend it to another hunter and please help me spread the word about efficient hunting stay tuned for the next episode where i'm gonna share a story about missing an ibex in Kazakhstan and the lessons learned that you can get from that episode. Thanks for listening.